Dirty Hands means clean theology. Can you dig it? Whoa, 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 what is going on, all my local guys and gals and long distance pals? We are back. You want to sing for us once? You, want to, you, you haven't sang in a couple weeks. Back in the saddle again. Uh, it's been a little bit. I was getting some withdrawal there. I'm back. I can't, I can't get that, huh? That was still pretty impressive. Pretty great. <laughs> But yeah, man, I'm I'm excited to be back uh, together. We're kind of in a string right now. Of um, we have a lot of great people that we've had uh, come on the show, and we have a few more coming up in the next few weeks. Um, I don't want to spoil some documentaries anything. together, piecing some amazing stuff together um, that's going to come out. And uh, oh man, between uh, the Prometheus lens, uh, between the dig stuff, and um, everything with the mustard seed that's going on, and the vessels podcast, our buddies there too. We. Just a lot happening, a lot of action. Um, man, just plethora. Be material. on the lookout for everything. Follow each and every one of those shows. Um, you will not be disappointed. A lot of great content. There is something for everybody. So get excited. But right now, today, I'm I'm really excited about. Uh, before we get excited, we, we're going to pray here. We're going to pray first, and I think actually it's my turn. Yeah. But for those that don't know, just just a little backstage insider information this is a repeat of a dinner conversation we had with a nice young lady at the go there for conference and we had such a a good conversation at dinner we we had to let you guys in on it so thank us later it will blow your mind (laughs) i promise you but um Let's uh, let's pray, and then we'll start digging in. Dear Lord, thank you for this time together. Thank you for everything you've given us, for every blessing that you give us that we continue not to deserve, but yet you see fit for us to have. Just continue to bless us as you have. Um, bless this show. Help it reach the person it needs to reach, the people it needs to reach. Help it, help it get to where you need it to go. Just bless this conversation and bless our time together, Lord, and... Um, as always, just help us keep moving forward and always focusing on you. In your name we pray. Amen. Mm. Amen. Amen. That was great. So, well, I appreciate it. Whew. Anyway, um, I want to introduce today someone like Justin just kind of gave us the, the backdrop, the story. We're sitting at a restaurant that I don't even remember what it was called, but we're sitting at a restaurant in Ohio at this conference and, um, and and this uh, this lovely young lady sits across from us and starts talking about some of these stories and we start going back and forth with some crazy stories and uh, and it just it, some of it blew my mind and I was like oh you you gotta you gotta come out and talk about this I got all excited so um, without any further ado uh, we have Aaron with us today and I am extremely excited to have you today I'm pumped to be on here and continuing our nice deep chat that was super fun. <laughs> And it was a Mexican restaurant, and I think I ate a lot of the chips. It was fabulous. They were, they were delicious. Yes, it was a Mexican restaurant. I remember that now. All right. Yeah, that's the already. Salsa. You know, it doesn't. That feels like it feels like it wasn't that long ago, but it's been a bit already just since that conference. Um, it, I we had a lot of people and, there too. You know, it was a we lot. had Joe Horn, Tom Dunn, Vicky Joy, Chris from Campermon. Uh, Justin and Jennifer. I mean, we just had a, I'll use the P word again, just a plethora of people. I think it's, a lot of people always... went to the restaurant too that night. Mm. I wasn't there for mm. very long, but I know Tom Dunn was there too. And then I know you guys did a show with Carl Gallops, which was incredible. And mm. Greg yeah, Reed, he... all the legends. It, there, that conference each year, and we've talked about it a couple of times. That conference has been, uh, we've been there the last two years and it has been, um, by far the favorite conference that we've been to. And we've, we've, uh, not been to a ton, but we've traveled the country. We've been as far as Texas and, uh, we were, we were in, uh, was it, uh, Louisville or Jeffersonville back the first one we went to. So we've, we've bounced around, been to a few of these conferences, but I will tell you, Mike Spaulding puts on one heck of a conference there in Brookville, Ohio. 
Um, it's, I think it's the last weekend of July each year. Guys, make sure you look into this. It is unbelievable. It is empowering. Your cup will be full when you leave and you get to meet amazing people. And, um, I mean, and everybody, these people that, that we look up to are so, I mean, in this space, we look up to a lot of those people. Like you said, like Carl Gallup's is just an amazing person that, you know, you sit there and the amount of books and the information that man has, and you, you sit down and he's just a great guy that wants to talk to you. It's just so cool that you can sit and talk to some of these guys that you really look up to. So I strongly encourage you to go to these conferences. Um, we actually will have uh, uh, a Mike Spaulding on with us here in the next few weeks too. So, so look forward to that as well. Um, love that guy. He's, he's amazing. So um, yeah, dig into that. Uh, make sure you're, you're showing up for one of those conferences, but uh, in the meantime, we have all these people that have their podcasts and have their shows, but the cool part about this is that everybody, you know, those people all get into a position because of, of their witness. And that's the thing that God does in their life, right? They have something amazing that God does in their life. And it's what, you know, Peter talked about, Paul talked about, they have their witness because they witnessed something. So now we go past the witness and we go into the testimony. That's what follows your witness, right? We have your testimony because God did something amazing in your life. And we have had all those people that we've had on there. But you know what? Each one of us has one of those stories, too. And Aaron here blew my freaking mind uh, while we times. were sitting at that. A couple times. <laughs> and I think there's more there. I think because we got a little hurried through some of that as well. So, um, Aaron, I'm kind of let you uh, kind of kick this off because I want you to tell us a little bit um, – I want you to tell us as much as you feel comfortable telling us about some of these things. Uh, some of the stuff is tough to talk about. I know. Um, and about yourself too, before you get too deep in the story, let everybody kind of know, you who know, you are background and yeah, the, all that good stuff. So they can get a feel for you. Yeah. Perfect. So my name's Aaron. I'm a mom of three children. I'm happily married to my husband. He's an Iraq veteran, a carpenter, do it yourself. He's a classic youper, hunky man. Love him very much. We have a little homestead, 30 acres, we garden farm, we've got chickens. He is a master canner and do-it-yourselfer, and I'm just really grateful to him because I'm living the life of my dreams that I never knew I wanted. You couldn't have told me in high school, like, that's what I would want, you know? Um, but that's exactly what I want, and we're really happy doing that. Uh, I've got two boys, six and eight, and a little daughter who's four years old. I'm a physical therapist, and... Um, I actually see a lot of pelvic health patients. So not only do I treat like all different aspects of the body, but I treat a lot of women that whether it's pregnancy, postpartum pain, pain with intercourse, I do see people that have been like assaulted, whether it was at a young age or older. Um, we do a lot of like physical as well as mental healing, as you know, if you've ever been in healthcare. And so I love my job. I kind of think of it as a ministry. As much as I want to be home with my kids full time, I know God has me there for a purpose and that I shine a light and give people joy at work. So the hard days, um, even the hard days, you just know that's where God wants you. So I'm really grateful for that. We homeschool our kids, which is super fun and just live a really active, outdoorsy, very busy, very fulfilled life. So that's kind of where I'm at now. I'm from a really small town. And honestly, guys, like this could go anywhere because I told you some really great stories about God, right? But I've also dealt with a lot of spiritual warfare too. But really, I want to glorify the Lord. I don't want to glorify darkness. But I have been able to conquer a lot of demons as well through my life, through the power of Jesus, not through my own strength because I'm just a carnal wretch and hot mess. But Jesus saved me despite all of my sins and my misgivings. And so I'm just really grateful to God for where I'm at. And I'm grateful that I have a really cool testimony, testimony that I can share with my kids and with people, um, which we can definitely get into. But I want to pause for a second and give you guys a chance to um, talk or I could go on and tell you more about my life. But anyway. So for me, um, like I said, your testimony is pretty amazing. I think spiritual warfare is um, something that we touch on quite a bit. I think it's very important because you have to know your enemy too, right? 
And right. our, our enemy attacks us in many different ways. So I have no problem getting into those types of things. We, we all carry heaviness at times. We all carry oppression at times. Sometimes it, you know, and, and it manifests in, in different ways. And sometimes it can be a lot harder, even into full possession with a lot of people that, mm-hmm. um, you know, we've talked to some people that have, you know, been in the deliverance ministry and things of that nature. And it's, it's very heavy stuff. I mean, it's stuff that uh, the majority of the church doesn't even like talking about, which is a little sad, a little scary because it's how we're attacked. It's how the, 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 you know, we all are attacked that way. So, and if you don't have the Holy spirit at your core, then you're leaving that open for something else. So it's, it's very important to, to always have that, but I, I let's, I don't want to, I don't know how to, how to do that, but I, I really, Cause I'm so excited. I kind of want you to tell us a little bit of, we sat down, we, we had this conversation and you started talking about when you and your husband got together. Yes. And, um, like I said, as much as you feel comfortable sharing, feel free, um, and kind of yeah. go into that story because it has an amazing ending. It's very, uh, uh, not exactly a, a fun beginning at all, obviously, but it has an amazing ending and it's, it's, it's one of the most amazing testimonies I've heard in a long time. That's awesome. So yeah, my husband and I got married in 2015, August 2nd was our wedding and I actually got pregnant on our honeymoon. We went to Hawaii on our honeymoon. And of course, first time, um, you know, you get the positive pregnancy blood work and everything and you don't think that when you tell people that you're going to be parents, that it could go south. You just don't think that could happen to you. And so we got pregnant on our honeymoon, called and told our parents, sisters, brothers, not like the whole world, but our close family that we were going to have a baby. And it was like, right. It wasn't months after it was pretty soon after though, that I miscarried. And so that was heartbreaking. And then I was really tracking everything like to the T like ovulation kits and where I'm at with my cycle and what's this. And just totally mind screwing it. Right. Cause we just wanted to have kids so bad. And then I ended up miscarrying again, um, a couple of months later. And in January, 2015, I was about between like six and eight weeks along and I had another miscarriage. And again, it was like, I had been spotting and they told me it was normal. And we had told, you know, close family, that sort of thing. And so it was just devastating after we had that miscarriage, of course. And so finally, I just looked at my husband and I was like, we're just done trying. This is just too painful. We can't do this anymore. Um, You know, you'd see baby clothes and just get upset or you'd find out that someone else is pregnant and you get sad. You know, a lot of people struggle for years and years with this. And so this was not years and years, but it was several miscarriages and lots of excitement. And so we decided we were done having kids. But in the meantime, I had had this transformational, I wouldn't say like, I wouldn't call it an encounter, but I had basically a transformational thought or realization what's missing, Aaron? Oh, what's always been missing in your life? Jesus. And I realized that all of my life, because I did, you know, there's plenty we could go into from childhood and stuff. But like all my life, I had been searching for something or looking for happiness somewhere else. And the only person that can truly make you happy the only is Jesus. And so I had just prayed and repented of all my sins, asked God to forgive me. I was listening to praise and worship music, journaling, reading my Bible and really growing closer to God. And so I had miscarried January 2015, but I was worshiping through the sorrow for the first time ever and also not mind screwing anything anymore. I I let that go. I let the worry go and I gave everything to God. And so February 1st, my husband and I I miscarried mid mid January. So there was no period or anything after the miscarriage. And then Jan or sorry, February 1st, my husband and I got together and it was a beautiful, holy union, the way that love should feel when you're engaging in, you know, intercourse with your spouse. And I just remember afterwards, my husband looking at me and he's like, should we have done that? Because we weren't safe. We didn't take precautions. And I was like, if God wants us to have a baby, we're going to have a baby. And even saying that I have goosebumps saying it, right? And so a week later, I was staying at my parents' house. They live on the lake. 
overlooking a huge lake, um, one of the Great Lakes. And it, I was staying in my sister's house because I have had some spiritual warfare in my parents' house and I never seemed to have it in my sister's room. And so I was sleeping in my sister's room by myself and I had woken up that morning and it was early in the morning and the sunlight was streaming through the window and I woke up to Jesus sitting at the foot of my bed and he looked right at me and said, you're going to be a mom. And he was just bathed in light and I just felt just filled with love and hope. And I called my husband. I'm like, Jesus said, I'm going to be a mom. We've got to get busy tonight. And I told him all about it. And so I went home and we, we had intercourse February 1st and February 8th. Cause I wasn't sure if Jesus was telling me to get busy or was I pregnant? I was kind of, Hmm, what was this here? Had this incredible transformation. Going to cover all bits. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And so it was really cool because when we staged, I found out I was officially pregnant on February 19th. And I was kind of always wondering, like, was he telling me to go home and, like, have this holy union with my husband? Or was I actually pregnant? And, of course, I was pregnant when he told me. Because when they staged the ultrasound, you could figure out, am I eight weeks along? Am I nine weeks along? When I finally went in for that ultrasound. And so it was, it was just a, an amazing gift after those miscarriages. I knew I didn't have to worry about this one because Jesus told me I'm going to be a mom. I'm going to be a mom. And uh, it was just incredible. So it, it was funny because like at every appointment, the doctor would look at me and be like, you know, when we get to this many weeks, like everything's okay. And when we get to like this, when you get to 19 or 20, like you should be good. And I just finally looked at him one day and I was like, do you believe in God? And he said, yes. And I said, if Jesus Christ takes the time to tell me I'm going to be a mom, I'm going to be a mom. And so that was my world shaking encounter with Jesus. And it's so cool. My first son, his name is Isaac, and it's a very biblical name. Oh, how appropriate. Right. Oh, man. Yeah. Definitely. So a really cool testimony to be able to look at him and be like, honey, you are meant for special things. Jesus told me I was going to be a mom when you were in my belly. And then just for all the kids to know that, I mean, it's not that seeing is believing, but it is cool to be able to have that testimony and share that with others and just to feel those goosebumps, you know, every time I tell that story and to relive that moment. So that is that was... You know, I audibly, I've heard the voice of God once in my ear, and that's the Thailand story I told you guys, which happened in 2009. So this had happened six years later, and that was when I visibly saw Jesus, and he told me, you're going to be a mom. And those are the two times, you know, like, I I definitely feel things. I can feel when the Holy Spirit's moving sort of thing, just like I'm sure you guys do. But those were really, really special moments in my life where God was clearly moving and giving me a lot of peace. I tell you, yeah. when you told that the first time and telling it this time is no different to me. I teared up both times. So to me, that is such a powerful testimony because it gives people hope. And it shows that not only is, is Isaac a, a, a miracle, but your next two kids are miracles as well. I mean, that's just an amazing thing. An amazing yes. testimony that yes. that you can give somebody because you see people that struggle with those things. Um, Justin has an amazing story about that, um, with his sister, uh, which, which you've Mm -hmm. talked about before, Justin, which is one of the most powerful things that I've ever heard too, because you see that. And then, um, actually, I don't know if you've read the book, um, the, the, uh, heaven's real, I think it says with the kid that, that passed away and, and then went and saw his baby sister that had actually been miscarried by his parent. Like Mm -hmm. I can't read that to my kid without crying. I just can't do it right? because it's such a powerful thing to see that, you know, that every one of those kids that have, that haven't made it or something like that, or, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, those things. Cause I have had multiple friends that have been through that or had stillborns or things like this to know that they're in Jesus arms right now is such a powerful thing to know that. And it tears me up every time I talk about it, but my gosh, I think that you having that testimony, the miracle that your kids are is one of the most powerful things that you can share with somebody. And it's just like Paul, Paul did it. And I think it's acts nine, I think 21 and like 23, he shares his testimony. I guarantee that's not the only time he did it, but that's what he used to bring people to God, to bring people to Jesus. 
is that testimony. So the more, when you have something powerful like that to keep it to yourself, that's, that's, that's wrong. You need to share that with everybody you can. So I appreciate you taking the time. I mean, talking about something that's very personal, right? but it's so powerful, such a gift. So thank you for that. But I do think you should jump back in and and tell us a little bit about Thailand and the other time God spoke to you, because that story is, uh, and you have to do the voice that you've done at the dinner to. table when you tell it. <laughs> yes. That's the only stipulation. Hey guys, this is Steve from the Dig Bible Podcast. I really hope you guys are enjoying the content, but also the sound quality. It's drastically improved since I handed that duty over to the handcrafted audio. If you've enjoyed the quality of the show and have any audio or editing needs, reach out to Jason at thehandcraftedaudio at gmail.com. And as always, keep digging. All right. I hope the voice is the same. I don't know that it would be any different. Um, But yeah, so um, (laughs) it's part of the experience. Yeah. Yes. I think we've got this. Yeah. No. So in 2009, I was traveling all over the world. Um, Not really all over the world, but several countries. So I graduated early before going on to physical therapy school and I traveled in Australia, New Zealand and Thailand. And New Zealand was planned. Australia was a surprise for a friend that wasn't planned. And Thailand was not planned. I actually called my parents and was like, hey, I'm thinking of going to Thailand. And they're like, could you please not? Because someone just died there. We just saw it on the news. There was this U.S. person and he died. You can't go to Thailand, you know. And so I called my parents two days later. Oh, I got my tickets to Thailand because I was on my own dime. I sold my car to travel because I went to school in New York City to get my doctorate in PT. And so my parents were like, you know, just horrified that I was going to Thailand alone. And I don't blame them because the day that I landed there, I landed in Bangkok, took a bus to go downtown and I get off the bus. And the moment I get off the bus, there's Thai guys like pointing up like hotel, hotel. And I'm, you know, I'm freaking out. I'm calling my Irish friend like, what do I do? These guys are pointing up at hotels and where do I go? You know, and so he told me to get in a tuk-tuk and where to stay and all the things. So I actually spent the first three days in Thailand in, in my bed by myself in this tiny little room crying. There was like a ceiling fan rotating above me and like communal bathrooms. And it was really depressing because I was like, what am I doing here? I'm kind of a target here as a woman, right? And so I resolved when I was out and about in Thailand to sort of look straight ahead. You don't can't smile too much at people, even though I'm a pretty friendly person. You got to kind of like, like aim for a target when you're out and about. And it turned out that I had met these really cool Australian men, like probably within a week of traveling there. One was the 70 year old guy named Pops. And then these two other guys in their forties that were traveling with, with one of the person's dad, Billy's dad was Pops. And so it was a really cool, sweet scenario because here I am now, I'm doing everything cheaply because I have zero money. I have like a thousand dollars to live on for a month. And uh, I, so I did everything not the way a tourist would do. I would take local trains and, and this and that. I had a really good travel book. So I ended up like God clearly brought me into contact with these men because they helped just protect me in general when we were out and about. I wasn't a target anymore. And at one point along our trip, after about two weeks of traveling together, my plan was to travel down south and meet up with an Australian girlfriend of mine and like dive down at in the islands with her I'm I'm a scuba diver so we were going to do all that and I went to catch my plane and I said goodbye to the boys and it was hard to say goodbye to them because we had so many adventures together they were like brothers and so we said our goodbyes and I go to board this plane and my flight is canceled and I'm like oh crap well now what well my flight's not headed out till the next morning So I decided I'm going to go surprise my friends. And they were up in the mountains in this little town called Pai. And anyway, earlier when I was in Thailand, I had gotten in a motorbike accident with one of the guys named Mark. And they had always made fun of me like, you can't ride a motorbike. Like you're kind of a wuss sort of thing. And so to prove them wrong, I rent a motorbike and I'm traveling up in the mountains in these windy roads, like up these hills, mountainous area. So I can meet up with my friends and surprise them because I still knew where they were staying. And on the way up in the mountains, I've never rode a motorbike before. I really don't know what the crap I'm doing. I can ride it, but that's about it. So I stop, I get gas in the vehicle. I'm like, I don't know how long this gas tank is going to last me. What if I don't have enough gas to get to the airport? So I stop, 
I get some extra spare gas, which is plenty, I'm sure. I had it like hooked on and roped to the back of the bike. And then I'm still mind screwing it. Like, what if I don't have enough gas to get back and I don't make it? And so I stop on the side of the road and I decide to ask this old, very kind looking Thai man uh, if he knew where I could find some more gas. So he motions for me to follow him and I'm following him and I'm on my motorbike and he's on his motorbike. And at one point we kind of pull off the side of the road because we're gonna use the restroom basically. And I just had this really eerie feeling when I got off the motorbike, like take your keys. Because where I'm from, you don't take your keys, the cars stay open, you'll probably leave your car running if you go into the gas station. It's just like, you don't think to lock things up or take things, but I had this thought, take your keys. And I went into the bathroom and when I got out, there was a second younger man, much taller, much more muscular, big, standing with the old guy and they're pointing up into the mountains saying, you come to my camp, you come to my camp, very authoritarian, ter you know, you know what I'm trying to say in a very authoritarian voice. And I am, I, you know, when you're in like a danger situation, like all your feelers go up, red flags go up, you know, you're in trouble. And I just knew I was in trouble. I knew this was not a good situation. And so I got on the motorbike and I, I, I told him something silly like, oh, I got to get my passport. My friends have my passport. Nope, can't go to your camp. Got to go. And so I get on the motorbike. We're traveling up these windy mountains. And these two men are sandwiching me now. So my, my vehicle's here. One of the guys is here and the other one's here. Like they are not letting me get anywhere. They're completely sandwiching me and pointing and screaming frantically about going up. You come to my camp. And so I basically knew if I could get to this certain checkpoint that I would be okay. Because as an American tourist or as somebody who looks more Caucasian, um, so to speak, like if you don't look like you're from Thailand, essentially, you don't get stopped at whatever this checkpoint is. And whatever this checkpoint is, I still don't understand it. I've never looked into it, but there are armed guards at this checkpoint with machine guns. And if you look like a tourist, you get waved through. They don't check your identification, nothing. You just get waved through and you can go into the village. And that's exactly where I was headed to see my friends. Whereas if you're Thai, you get stopped. So I knew in my head, if I can just get to that checkpoint, I'll be safe. If I could just get to that checkpoint, I'll be safe. So we get to the checkpoint and I get stopped, which is another red flag because I should not be stopped. But I think the guy who was trailing me like very closely was waving for the machine gun guy to stop me. So now I'm sitting here and there's this Thai man to my left, this old man and the other one behind him, the younger guy. And then this big machine gun guy to my right. And they're pointing and pleading with machine gun dude. She come to my camp. You come to my camp. Come to my camp. And all of a sudden, in my ear, I hear the audible ver voice of God say, go. And I took off as fast as I could. And those guys did not stop me. I made it to my friends. I was perfectly safe. The next day, um, my friend Billy took me on his motorbike. He got me to the airport safe. But I was in tears, just totally in shambles, because I knew it was a dangerous situation. And it was, if it wasn't for God, I don't know what it would have done. I wouldn't have thought to just race away because it didn't seem safe to do that. When you have a guy standing with a machine gun to your right and these other two guys. Shot in the back. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, you never know. I mean, he could have shot me easily. He had a machine gun, um, but I got away. And But it was because I heard go loud, audible, clear in my voice, just completely saving me out of that situation. And what I find fascinating about that is that it wasn't like I was this born again, spirit filled believer and God was there for me because I was spirit filled and on fire for God. I was backslid. I was into the new age at the time, you know, like it wasn't, it's just amazing how many times in your life do you not realize that God is there with you or that there's an angel there protecting you. God cares for you. It doesn't matter what you've done or what sins you've committed. Like he was there for me and he saved my life. Um, and there's been more times in my life where God has saved my life. Um, but that was audible in my ear. So that was my, that's my Thai story. And hopefully I got the voice just like I did at dinner. It, it was close, but it was a yeah. little close. deeper. It was a little deeper. Yeah. You had a little more the authoritative. There's more, yeah. more chop. Right. You'll come to my camp. Yeah. My camp. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> cool. Because you were saying about how God 
um, you know, was looking out for you even while you were not in your, you know, your Christian walk. Right. And I think that's super important for people to understand is, is, you know, just cause you're not in a walk with God yet, God's still calling you, you know, God's still knocking on your heart. You know, it says he stands at the door and knocks, you know, he's, he's, ba- he's waiting for you. He'll meet you halfway, but you got to come open the door. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't mean that he doesn't have a plan for you. That doesn't mean he has something in store for you for the future. You might not have figured it out yet. Cause it took me a while to figure it out. Believe me, it took me a while to figure it out. And, and, um, Still figuring it out. Still, well, I mean, yeah, I'm still figuring it out. But, but I mean, when I'm talking about my, my faith walk, my, my mm. um, understanding that, you know, what team I was playing for, because for a while I was on the wrong team, very, very mm-hmm. much so on the wrong team. So knowing the things that happened to me as a kid and how many times God saved my life before I truly had that faith walk is, is it, it's one of those things, if you look at it in that perspective. I think that's why some people are, you know, they, it's thrown off. I said, why do good things happen to these bad people? Well, maybe God's still working on them. Maybe God is blessing them to get them to a certain place. Maybe they won't ever turn, but he's given them that opportunity. I don't know, but we'll never I've always seen that as works. like, you know, the fatherly role, you know, uh, the, the father don't discipline kids. It's not his. So a lot of wicked people you see prospering, it's because, you know, they're, they're not God's children yet. So therefore they don't, they don't get the rod of correction because a lot of people look at, you know, that kind of stuff as bad, you know, it's something done to you. Well, no, I mean, if you got kids, you know that the rod is because they love you and it's done for you, not mm-hmm. to you. Exactly. That's a good way to think of it. Mm. It's amazing. Yeah. I don't, it's, it's, I don't know. It's a powerful thing. Now you were saying kind of before uh, our little glitch there that, that God has saved your life a few times. And yeah. I'm kind of interested to hear a couple more of your uh, uh, God stepped in and saved your life stories. Yeah. So, okay. So just like a couple, a couple things. I'm trying to think of what came first. So when I lived I don't know if I would call this like saving my life, but I went through a traumatic experience and God, I think, allowed me to get away from the experience. When I lived in New York City in 2000, so Thailand was 2009. In the summer of 2010, when I was living in New York City, I was studying for an exam and I was laying not in Central Park, but there's a little park along the Hudson River. And I was, I was about, I I would ride my bike down because I would want like a little piece of uh, Michigan with me, basically. And I kind of felt at home by the river, even though it's kind of dirty and gross, you know, but that's where I would go study. And so I was laying on the grass studying and I felt something on my butt, okay, for lack of a better word. And it felt like almost like a fly or something when it lands on you. And it was a full broad daylight, middle of the afternoon, naked, deranged man um, attempting to rape me in broad daylight. And it's like one of those stories that you hear where you're screaming for help and nobody comes to help you. Like that legitimately happened. I was able to like wedge my elbow really hard against the guy and run away from him. Um, I got away and then he sat surrounded by all my books like, getting off on the situation, which was extremely disturbing, called 911. Finally, these old ladies kind of came up and I got really far away from the guy, but I could still see him. Um, But just, it's crazy. You know, you hear so many people that go through that. And I was really lucky that I wasn't, other than being bruised, I wasn't hurt. But it was a horrific experience where, okay, now you're calling 911. He tries to do it to other women. So you're trying to identify the guy and you're completely... Completely and totally, it's like one of those episodes of Law and Order where you're like, why don't you know it's number three? And it's because you're so traumatized. Like, you just can't pick out the person correctly. So he saved me, I think, in that situation from not getting roughed up to the extent that I could have. The guy got put away. I think God made that situation better than it could have been. And I was able to heal from that situation and go back to the city despite being under some trauma, you know, from that. Um, that's all I was getting at with that situation. <laughs> I don't know how pretty, much of, But yeah. what's cool about that is you talked about what you do for a living now and you deal with some people that go through that. Um, right. And actually, you know, but it, on the, the bad end of it where it, it doesn't, you know, got, 
there's no nothing stepped in and nothing, you know, it I don't know how else to say that. Rape. It happened. Right. Like, it happened true and rape it could happened have been a lot and worse. that's awful. But right. you have an experience and understanding what the trauma to some degree of what somebody goes through. So right. it helps you in what you do and God lets you be a witness in something in your in your life where we've talked about that a million times. Like I can I, I've said this before, like I, I've never been addicted to cocaine. So I can go up to somebody and say, Hey, you know, you shouldn't do cocaine, it's bad for you. But they look at me and go, You have no idea. You don't know what this is like. You know, what my addiction's like. You don't know. But if I had been and I recovered and you know, through the grace of God, he helped me through something, yeah. I'm just more say relatable. no. It, yeah, well, I'm more relatable. It's like the old, remember the old commercials, or if you guys are probably way younger than me, but the, uh, the, the, the crack, the egg in the frying pan, this is your brain, this is your brain on drugs. Do you remember those commercials? I used to love yes. those commercials. I don't yes. know why I loved them, but I did love them. But, um, it's those things where, you I grew know, up during the dare lion dare. I remember the dare stuff. We had that in high school a lot too. They'd always have them, them got like hype guys come to your school and, and try to get y'all excited about, you know, resistant drugs or whatever. The, I don't even remember what dare stood for. Nothing that did was just made you more curious. You're talking about drugs all the time. That just makes you want to go see what all the fuss is about. I mean, that's how it did me anyway. Had an opposite reaction. The, they should have done with that. Like they did with what they did for my sex ed in high school. All they did. And I, they literally didn't tell us anything about the, the actual process or anything. All they did was show you pictures of STDs. That's all they did. And you're like, Nope, I'm good. I'm good. If that's what gonorrhea, if that's what syphilis looks like, if that's what, it, Nope, I'm good. I'm out. I'm good. Have Tom Hanks dress up like Jimmy Dugan from league of their own and come talk to you. Remember that he signed the baseball and he said, oh avoid oh the clap. Man. Jimmy oh, Dugan. Gosh. We could go anywhere. Said, with That's that. good advice, kid. Oh goodness. <laughs> That's pretty much what my what my uh high school uh sex ed education was. So um It sounds like it worked yeah, though. I don't know. Well, I, I do have a really crazy story about spiritual warfare, but uh well, who knows? Let's let's jump into that. Why don't you step in and talk a little bit about spiritual warfare? I know me and Justin both can attest to a lot of trials and tribulations in our lives. And honestly, a lot of mine has actually ramped up since we started doing this, because as soon as you're doing what you're called to do, um, you, you're, you're going to be attacked more because now, you know, you, you're truly identifying as a soldier for Christ, right? You're truly saying, this is the team I'm on. You're not in the middle. You're not lukewarm. You're here. You're not, you're, 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 you put your stake in the sand. This is my flag. I'm here. Mm -hmm. And then boom, it comes at you. And I know it's hit me more now than ever before. I know Justin the same way. And um, I'm sure you can feel that too. Yeah, without a doubt. Um, I mean, in terms of the spiritual realm, I was always, I think, aware of it as a kid where you would see or hear things or this or that. There was maybe some Freemasonry components in my generational line, right? But where it got really bad for me and really crazy was 2012 when I was in Australia living with this creepy couple that I found on Australian's version of Craigslist because I was there for an internship. And I lived in a, a little room, kind of looked like Harry Potter's bedroom, you know, like just this little under dingy. The stairs. Room. Yeah, not under the stairs, but just like ants crawling on the wall. It was just kind of nasty. And the people I lived with, it was a, a couple, they were together. They would always tell me, like, we can't wait to get you drunk. And they were just into really dark things. The woman kind of looked really witchy. The guy, real dark features into, like, the, kind of the vampire-esque movies and that sort of thing, right? They were just kind of a weird, creepy couple. You just felt a little uneasy around them. But I was, I, I had paid my money. It was just a place to live. And that was that. But one night I'm staying in this house and I have a dream. And in the dream, I can see the girl whose name was Laws, L-O-Z, who I was living with. And in the dream, I saw her say, don't blow her life candle out. And she went and blew out this candle. And all of a sudden, in real time, I'm laying on the bed in this little Harry Potter's closet type room that I'm in. And I can see an entity, bright blonde, right on top of my face, just staring me down with this just evil smirk in his eyes. He sort of looked like the Blade Runner entity 
um, like the blonde guy from Wesley Snipes from that Blade Runner movie, which I hadn't seen since high school. It wouldn't have been fresh on my mind, and it wasn't the same person, you know? And obviously it wasn't a person, it was a supernatural thing. But that's all I can relate it to. And this figure was on top of me with this wicked smile, and then he sank down onto me and disappeared. And after that, every night when I would go to sleep, I could feel things crawling up and down my legs. I felt spiritually heavy. My heart felt heavy. Why did this happen? Well, I was living in sin at the time. Honestly, I do think that was my open door, like a sin that was committed that brought that in as well as the people I was living with. But it took me, I mean, it took me 10 years to be able to tell somebody besides for my husband, my mom or my sister that story because I was so afraid that if I talked Bring about it, it that, it would, that it would get worse. And it did. It was one of those things. I was not a Christian at the time and I was living in sin and knew I had sinned. It was like deep within me that that Christianity that had been instilled as a child, that deep Holy Spirit conviction was there. And I knew what I had done was wrong. And I think that a doorway was opened. Right. But I didn't know how to get rid of it because I didn't know spiritual warfare was a thing. I didn't know that sleep paralysis and waking up and feeling something on your chest and not being able to move that that happened to people. I didn't know that you could see a black cat or a glitch in the matrix, which I would see, right? I didn't know any of that. And finally, out of, I ended up moving out of the house because I had gotten in a bike accident, split my elbow open to the bone and was in an Australian hospital for three days. And I finally was like, I got to get out of this house. Like, I can't be with these people because they were so weird when I got in the accident. Very controlling. Wouldn't bring me my phone charger. Just very creepy people. And I was like, I got to get out of here. So I ended up living with a friend's parents for a while. And then I found a different house to live in, which was like a great living environment. But I was afraid to tell the people I was living with that it was still happening. I wouldn't see the entity, but I would feel it. You'd have that sleep paralysis attack where you can't move. You're trying to scream and you can't scream. And my mom told me, told me in the name of Jesus, you got to tell it. You got to command this thing to leave. She told me because she knew, but I couldn't get the words out to, to even like rebuke this thing. But eventually I got the words out and I could get this, whatever it was to go, but it would always come back and come back and come back. Um, and like I said, it took, it was kind of 10 years off and on of this happening. It wasn't all the time. It got less severe as time went on, but it would still happen to some extent. And when it got crazy out of control was right before my husband and I got baptized. Cause it had been like kind of neutral. Like you're kind of used to it. Like, you know what to do at this point. I'm a strong Christian so I can rebuke it. And it's easier to get the words out. And I found that if I had a hard time rebuking it, if I said, prayed Psalm 23, whatever was afflicting me would go away. Whether it's a shadow entity, a hat man, a smoke-like entity, you name it. Little people, I've seen it, guys. Like, I've dealt with a lot. But right before we got baptized was when it ramped up big time. I mean, I got punched in the head in the middle of the night. I visibly, you know, I could feel my head getting punched. I saw this entity that almost looked like a demonic J.R.R. Tolkien in black and white with like a wisp and a red hat shaking his fist at me. Um, but it really was looking back like generationally, is there something that has caused this? Did I open a door somewhere? Um, how can I rebuke this thing? Vicki Joy Anderson's book was crucial for me. Mm -hmm. Greg Reed's book, War of the Ages, anointing my home, praying Psalm 91, 23, 27, and really just knowing that we need childlike faith to deal with these things. So many people think it's a formula. Or is it this or is it that? Well, it's not. Magic a lot of words. It's, yes. Like that childlike faith. So that's like a very condensed version of some of the spiritual warfare I've dealt with. And what's interesting is if you don't deal with it as a parent, your kids are going to deal with it. Because I do have kids that can like see and sense into the spiritual realm and they tell me what's going on. And I have had to pray Psalm 91 in their room, like on repeat, Shane and Shane, repeat Psalm 91 CD. And Greg Reed mentioned this, that when he got in his bike accident, and he was so weak that he couldn't, you know, like, it's like, you can't pray because you're so weak. What do I do? Well, he would put worship music on. Because at the very least, you've got that there to help you. And maybe you're right. Maybe we needed to talk about this. But um, it took me years to be able to talk about it. Because it's like a source of almost shame, too. And you don't realize other people are going through it. 
Um, every now and then we deal with something, but not to the extent like we were, but it usually ramps up. Like you said, the closer you are to God or the more you're leading people to Jesus, that's when the enemy hits. And that's what the church doesn't talk about. That's what your pastor doesn't talk about. Oh, you're born again and spirit filled. Why are you getting afflicted? What did you do? Are you watching porn? You watching porn? You got a secret sin? But it's not always that, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the thing. Uh, for the longest time, I was very ashamed to talk about my, my past. And especially when you're on a platform trying to do what we do and then one day it just, it, it did, it just hit me. It was just the, the Holy Spirit. It was just like, you know, hey, dude, this ain't about you. This is about me. And you don't think there's other people that's been through what you've been through or are going through what you went through. And if you can talk about it and as dirty as it seems to you, it ain't nothing compared to what somebody else is going through. And if they can see that, the, Hey, you were there, you came out of it and look what you're doing now that it gives people hope. Yes. You know, it ain't easy to talk about being hooked to, to amphetamines and making drugs, selling drugs and, uh, all the sexual promiscuity and, uh, even having my own attachments and having succubuses come and visit me in the middle of the night. You know, it sure, it sure doesn't help my, my, my image at all, but it ain't about me. Right. Yes. I've dealt with that too, with that incubus spirit coming to you. And then same thing with the sexual promiscuity and not to blame shift. Cause you don't, you don't want to blame shift and like, Oh, that friend made me do it. They told me I should do it. Right. There are so many temptations out in society, but it's so normalized in our culture. I think we all were probably similar ages where we grew up with that. And I wish I could go back and tell myself, your body is a temple that is meant for your husband. Um, I wish I could like really just shake myself and I can't. And there are sins I've committed that I can never take back. And sometimes I can get in that guilt phase where I'm like, oh my gosh, how could I ever be accepted by Jesus? How could I ever go to heaven after what I've done? But you realize Isaiah 118, though your sins be as scarlet, he will make them as white as wool. You know, and as white as snow, I don't have it perfectly paraphrased here, right? My Bible's right over there. I'm not going to grab it because I don't want another glitch. But we need to know it doesn't matter what you did. Jesus loves you. You just need to repent, repent of that. And it, it does help to talk about it. Um, and we don't need that perfect Christianese religiosity aspect i don't think that draws anyone to the lord it's this breaking down um and getting personal whether it's about miscarriages or spiritual warfare or whatever it is that's what can help lead people to jesus is like you said steve like sharing your testimony and i think i'm really impressed with you guys because i think that men are under attack much more than women not to say that women aren't under attack, but I don't see as many strong men rising up and being strong Christian leaders, strong spiritual leaders in their home. I think that men can be so easily distracted from gaming, porn, um, whether it's like, what? yeah, your football game or your sports or whatever it else. And women struggle with porn too. Like that was a stronghold for me too. At one point in my life, I, I can admit that with, with shame, I'm not proud of it. But when I truly repented of that and asked God to cleanse me from that, I was cleansed from that, like with no desire to do that type of thing or watch that because your eyes are the window to your soul. You can't unsee those things, unfortunately. Sometimes I wish my memory could be wiped to some of the dumb stuff that I've done. But where I find people struggle and what I'd love you guys to speak to if you're comfortable with it is about why is it or how can we help men to rise up and like take their spiritual strength. Cause I know so many people who are war heroes, but they're not necessarily spiritual heroes. And I'm just very impressed with you for doing this podcast and for putting yourself out there and wanting to lead people to the Lord. Cause you don't always see that in men. And uh, especially in the culture where I live, you don't see that. You see a lot of alcohol abuse, a lot of um, escapism. Mm-hmm. 
I think that's, you know, it's a 12 step program. You first have to, no, I'm kidding. But when you go, when you go through anything like this, you know, stepping into this light, like Justin said, there's things that are very difficult to talk about. Um, I've been under a lot of that warfare myself. Like it attacks me in different ways that I never, ever saw coming, but that's sometimes the trick of the enemy, right? Is they get you from an angle. You're, you're guarded over here. You have your shield up on this side, but all of a sudden, wham, you get blindsided over here. And it usually comes in waves and you feel it. Like it's not just one thing. It'll be 10 things at once. And I'll tell you, I'm going through it right now. I have 10 different things on my plate that are eating me alive. And I know that God's got it, but it's easy for us to fall back and be like, and and like you said, for example, I wish you, you say you wish you could go back and you could erase your mind. I look back at the things I've done, which I'll t- I've done things that I can't even speak. I mean, God has forgiven me. I know he has, but when I look back is God doesn't see it anymore. But the problem is the enemy doesn't let you forget it. So he comes at you. That's one of his greatest gifts is giving you insecurity. Or I would say gifts. One of his greatest uh, uh, weapons, I should say, is giving you insecurity, is making you question yourself, making you question your faith, making you question, um, um, are you good enough for God? Are you good enough? Like, how can you be with everything you've done? How can you even say you're a Christian? With everything that you have in front of you, how can you say this? And it's something that tears me down at times. And then I sit down and, and this is something that we, we preach every week is if you are not sitting down and vested in your Bible, if you are not reading through scripture, if you are not giving time and prayer to God, you are losing the battle already mm-hmm. because you're, you're not listening. You're not letting God speak to you. You're not letting, you're not giving it to God. So that doesn't mean things are easy. That doesn't mean that, you know, me and Justin, I know, and and some of our other good friends go through things. Um, They have weight on their shoulders. I see it. And, and the thing is, as men, the we're, we're programmed from a young age to be, you know, strong, macho. Exactly. And that we, you know, we can handle it on our own. We can do this. And it's so hard to break don't down. Cry. We, we don't talk about our problems. We suck it up and keep marching forward. Exactly. And we, we get stuck in that so bad that we don't realize we need other men to talk about these problems with. It's the same thing. Women need to talk to other women about their problems. They need to understand because you're going to have a more relatable aspect. Men need to be Drop able to robotic church you know, mindset. That's what I've said plenty of times on the show. It's like we get so many people want to be, you know, speak and walk Christianese and they have their own struggles, their own vulnerabilities, their, their own imperfectness. But we're human, but everybody thinks they should be button up suit and tie. Uh, and I, I could never do what you guys do because I know how screwed up I am. I, I'm the type of guy that, you know, uses four letter words on a daily basis, you know, and, uh, you know, and I'd be a hypocrite if I'd done that. Well, no, the, the hypocrites are the ones, the suit and tie. Oh, when I, when I gave my life over the Lord, it all changed. I was perfect after that. The, no. And, and, and as bad as you want to put forth that perfect image, you know, you are robbing other people from coming to you and coming to the Lord or coming to you with their problems because you are unrelatable. Those types of people that are being, they're ultimately being fake, but they're, they're doing what they think is best. It's what they should do. Right. But people are not going to come to you and talk to you and be vulnerable to you because in their mind, you have this picture perfect image and you can't, you don't understand them. You can't relate to them. So, yeah, I mean, that's just something that that's pushed the testimony thing. That's you know, pushed so it, many people out of church yeah. is that they see what they think. These people are, are holier than thou. There's the suit and tie bunch. Like, I, you know, I don't wear earrings. I don't do this. I don't do that. I can't look this. I can't wear a band T-shirt. I can't do, you know, like you, you see this and you are, are like, oh my gosh, like I could never be like them. I could never be that good, but you're getting the superficial picture. 
-hmm. We are all sinners. We all fall short. And the minute that you put yourself on a pedestal or you try to pretend that you're on a pedestal, all you're doing is pushing people away because your experiences and things that you've been through, like I said, your witness that turns into your testimony, I'm broken. I go to church broken every week. I, I come to this podcast broken every week. I come to this table and talk to you at a Mexican restaurant. I'm broken that day. And God picks up the pieces and puts me back together. And if without God, I'm broken every day. So, I mean, that's something that we all have to be able to admit. It's a powerful thing. And Justin, we've talked about this a couple of times because he said, we look at these conferences that we go to. There is not a lot of young men and I'm, I'm calling myself young. That's I'm, I'm 44. So I'm not really young, but there is most of those people are 60 and above that we see at these conferences. I'm very worried that if we don't have more people step up into this space, what's the future hold? Because we're not seeing a big, we see a lot of younger people at these conferences, but what's the difference between me and anybody else out there? What's the difference between just anybody else out there? You know what it is? We bought a microphone. That's it. We're no different. We're just talking about yes. these things. We said yes. We said yes. And that's that's where I think this is really important. And I'm worried. I, I love listening to your testimony, your thing. You have stories to tell. You have people that need to hear these things. And we all need to to follow what God calls us to. Sometimes, you know, that it, for, for somebody, it might be that just where they are in life, they're supposed to reach that one person. That's what God has on their heart. That's the thing. And seasons change and new things come and new callings come. But right now, God has put us in this position right here for the three of us to talk. He's made this happen. This isn't us. He's made this happen. So somebody's supposed to hear this. Somebody's supposed to take something from this. And that's our prayer, like we say at the beginning of this, Help it reach that one person that needs to hear it because my gosh, it, you know, if, if we can plant one seed that all the, my gosh, the amount of time, money, effort that we've put into just doing this stuff is all worth it for one person. So that's, that's, and I think that's a pretty cool question. I think that's cool, but I think that more younger people, men and women need to step up into this role, into this ministry role. And I'm not talking about the church. I know. And the church is needs a lot of help too, but the people that are on the outside looking in that don't think they're good enough to come to God, they need to see people like us that are the same. We're broken. <laughs> we are not perfect. And the thing too, is it don't have to be a drag. And, and I'll say this outright because some people probably look at me bad, but I'm just being honest. Uh, God, knows all of his children and if you're a parent you know every single child has a different love language you talk to them a certain way you get to them a certain way you know what i mean each one is different and god knows you and knows how to speak your love language or to do things to entice you well his purpose is the kingdom work and i would love to say you know I just want to save that one person or I just want to save that one soul, you know? And I mean, I do, of course I do. But honestly, the, the main reason that I'm here is because I love having these conversations with these authors and these speakers. I love going on these treasure hunts and finding these little nuggets of gold. I mean, it's pretty pretty selfish why i do this i love talking and finding these things but god uses that for his glory he's like all right justin now i'm gonna throw you some nuggets and let you talk to some of these people but i'm gonna take your selfish desires and turn them to my glory and use them to my benefit so it's like you know doing a podcast might not be your thing but find your thing whatever you love to do and that you enjoy find a way to do it for the kingdom and god will bless it and not only will he bless it you will have one hell of a time while you're doing it that to, for me that that's the the secret sauce <laughs> without a doubt well, aaron aaron what is next for you like what's the plans for the future I mean, you, you, I, I know exactly what you do for a living. I understand it. I know I'm in the, the, the field as well. Um, 
and that's your season. That's where you're at right now. That's what God's telling you to do. And, and sometimes you, 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 you know, it's, we always have to be listening. We always have to know what, you know, God's telling us, okay, this is our next step. But I'll tell you this, I think that'd be a, that you could write a pretty powerful book. I'd tell you that or something along those lines. So I, I think it would be, um, you know, if, if you're not being called to that yet, I, I could see something like that around the corner. It's funny because I love to write and I've always wanted to write a book. But when I look at my life, I wonder if I would hurt certain people if I was like really honest about certain things, you know, like it's always held me back. What if I hurt somebody because I'm brutally honest about this? I think I would help more people than I would hurt. But I've actually always wanted to write a book because I do have some crazy stories. I mean, I really do. Just, I don't know. It's funny that you say that that. because I've pondered that for a long time and I haven't felt God calling me to put pen to paper yet or to start typing it out. But I actually love to write. Um, It's it's something that I'm passionate about. So you never know. Could it be a book someday? I've honestly ruminated on that for a long time. I don't know. I don't know what the future holds. It's something that I've prayed about for a while because I, I don't feel like I'm doing enough for the kingdom of God to bring people. I feel like my my kids are my ministry, of course, and my work is like a ministry, but I don't know what else God is calling me to do. I have thought about a book many times over the years. People have told me that because there's so many more stories we could talk about if we weren't glitching here and there. Like, how did I make it out of Ubi Hebe Crater alive, you guys? I climbed out 700 feet up. I had to jump from one part of a crater about at least, I don't know how many feet we're talking about, but it was a big jump to, to be able to, to be 700 feet up, jumping from this end of the crater to that end of the crater and getting out of this crater. I mean, we didn't even go into that story. But there's been so many times when out in it on adventures, God just saved my life or told me, don't do that. You're going to die if you do that. Turn me around from making some big rock climbing mistakes and stuff like that. But I don't know. Maybe you guys, you can pray for me and tell me what you think is next. Because I love this. I love getting deep with deep people and deep chats and helping people to heal. That's part of what I do as part of my job. But I wish I was bringing more people to Jesus and I don't know how I will do that yet. So we can all just pray about it and be prayed up about it. You know, it starts you an anonymous uh, blog or the, the, what they call them now, the sub stacks. If you're worried about hurting people, just go in with an anonymous name and you said you enjoy it. Right. I think so. you got to look at it this way. And this is, this is how I believe it. Because if you look at what Justin, he's talking about how, I mean, you look, he's got a gift for this. Justin's very good at this. He has a, um, a natural aptitude to do these things. You have to look at the gifts that God's given you. He's given us spiritual gifts. He's given us physical gifts. He's given us things to do this. And if you love to write and you're good at writing, well, guess what? Maybe that's the gift that God gave you for a reason. And maybe that's the answer you need, but who knows? We have to pray on things and um, we'll be praying for you. And I hope you're praying for us. And uh, yes, yeah, I've loved this conversation today. It's been, it's been pretty awesome. I really appreciate you taking the time. Thanks for having me. It's funny. Cause I was actually uh, the only people that told that I was coming on was Jen and Justin. I was like, just pray God gives me the words to speak. And I said, you know, I don't, wouldn't be hopping on this with just anybody, but I'm comfortable with these guys. Like, I just felt like the moment we sat down, you guys were just long lost friends and that we could sit for hours around a campfire, just chatting it up. And uh, I, I just love that about you guys. You're so approachable. Yes, Detroit Lions. <laughs> Miss Michigan. You boy. We got, the, us Michiganders yeah. got to, you know, stick together too. So Yes. So, a bunch thanks. of damn Yankees. I'm outnumbered this time. <laughs> <laughs> it's one, of, one of the first times ever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I just well, man, everybody out there watching. Oh, sorry. Yeah. No, I just appreciate you guys doing what you do. Like, please know you are touching so many lives and to be in your presence, like just to be here, I feel at at peace talking to you guys because you feel like brothers to me and you are brothers in Christ. But especially to meet you in person, it was just incredible, that feeling of camaraderie and friendship. And it is like a little slice of heaven, like a little family reunion is really what it feels like. And that's what this conversation is like, too. Just so easy 
And uh, that's the gift that God has given you guys. So don't forget that either, even on the hard days. Yeah, I even told you at the conference, you know, I, I seen you last year and I knew we all run in the same circles and we were in groups together and stuff. And maybe in passing had it had some, you know, comments, exchange and stuff, but didn't get to speak with you last year. And I remember on a thread or something you were talking, I was like, I'm going to make a point to come talk to you this year. <laughs> I'm really glad you did. That's awesome. Mm, me too. Yeah. Well. As always, everybody out there watching, listening, however you're uh, consuming this, I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, I know I have. I know Justin and Aaron have. This is this is the kind of stuff that that you know where two or three are gathered in His name, He's there. So I hope that you feel what I feel in these conversations and how powerful it is and how much God's behind it. And um, as always, everybody, remember God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. Get them fingernails dirty, grab your shovel, and keep digging. Boom. We thank you for listening to the Dig Bible Podcast. Questions, comments, or future episode ideas? We'd love to hear from you at the dig 423 at gmail.com. If you enjoy our content, don't forget to share, subscribe, and check out our Facebook group at the Dig Podcast. Remember, you can't lean on a shovel and pray for a hole. You gotta dig. <laughs>